Hello, I'm Jordan, and welcome to this Empire Building feature video for Total War Three Kingdoms, where today we'll be trying to conquer the Silk Road. Jumping straight in, we have two noteworthy characters for our faction in Pandur and Ma Chao, a most brilliant warrior. We have access to the unique Xi Lian Supply Lines building and have early access to several Qiang cavalry units. Our leader, Ma Tung, gives us reduced cavalry upkeep and additional shock cavalry damage, as well as our huge economic boon in gaining plus 100% to all silk and spice income. As we join here as Governor Ma Tung, we start with a split hold between the Jincheng and Wudu commanderies. I've killed the initial Yellow Turban Rebellion Army who are encroaching on my silk trader and have began mustering just outside the border of Wudu Town proper. As you can see, the Yellow Turban Army has I a strong foothold in this region, and if we click on the badge above the town, we see they are led by the rebel Jabor. But remember, if we click on the town itself and go down to the garrison icon, we can also see the town itself provides a further six units and a captain to their defence. I'm going to open the recruitment panel and take on some medium spear infantry and an additional unit of Chiang Raiders who benefit from both my faction cavalry perks and finally an extra character. Not just anyone though, my wife, Mei Lan Li. Right now she's unsatisfied, but more so than that she is our only available character to call to arms as a general, and as a purple sentinel she's more than equipped for the job. Ma Lan Li brings with her two axe band infantry units, so we're going to add two medium sword infantry to that as well to make for a fairly offensive army composition for our first attack. As some of my units are newly recruited, they are still replenishing and not at full strength. We're going to push halfway to Wudu Town and see if they come out to meet us. As we're in enemy territory, we'll go from replenishing based off of the local town's resources in an owned region to instead just sustaining ourselves on our military supplies to not take attrition. As the military supplies panel shows us, our characters and faction provide us a combined 48 military supplies, yet the harsh colds of winter and the mountainous terrain means we are suffering minus 30 supplies. If I consider only moving 50% of my maximum range and going into the encamp stance, we can counteract this. If we take a turn and look at our penalties in spring the next season, we can see the penalties are actually even larger, with a minus 40 from hostile territory as well as the minus 5 from terrain. Whenever you're going on a large conquest, consider your military supply levels carefully, as if you run out, attrition and starvation will quickly cripple your forces, as well as directly affecting the morale of your troops in battle. We push forward and our troops are outnumbered two to one. But I have faith in the ability of our generals and our men to shatter the spirits of the peasant uprising and bring the town to bear. The battle is hard fought. I hope for my cavalry to break through on the right flank while I attack two other entrances simultaneously. Jabur is smart and uses his ranged infantry to brutal efficiency. I win, but by the skin of my teeth. My army looks very much worse for wear. Wudu Town is ours. It's cost me dearly, but as the linchpin of the Wudu Commandery, it is worth the sacrifice. If I open up my settlement panel, we can start some basic management within this commandery. Firstly, if we look at the reserves and population panel, we can see the total amount of stored food reserves in this commandery. This can be identified by using the F1 info panel overlay. Reserves are filled by having a surplus of food or incoming supplies. They define how quickly your army's military supplies replenish. In this case, I have a meager plus two reserves slowly filling my town, but zero surplus food on top of that for my people. As a result of this, we can see not only does this mean my armies get plus six military supplies per turn commandery wide, but also that as the capital of this commandery, I can hold out during a siege for at least 12 turns before facing starvation. Wudu Town is also the population linchpin of my commandery, currently housing a maximum of 301,000 people, just as its basic level 1 town. Your population in each province is viewable via the population icon and is a representation of the living growing towns and cities within your commandery's regions. These population centres are directly responsible for the income you get from your peasantry, as well as the rate of replenishment you will get for newly recruited or damaged armies. The more you invest in your green peasantry buildings, as we see here, the more both of these bonuses will increase as your population grows. As I said before, my focus here is on Silk, which is the blue learning and market building chain. My faction gets a plus 100% bonus to Silk and Spice income, so to maximise our economy, this is the most straightforward road to go down. With plenty of money saved up, but very little coming in per turn, we want to get the Wudu Silk Trader town upgrading as soon as we possibly can. 
we look at the building browser, on the left we can see the info panel and the benefits provided by each level of building, as well as what it unlocks, in this case silk to trade with, and the garrison that it provides the town as well. We have other building options, but only one province or building slot can be upgraded at any one time in a commandery, so let's get this one going quickly. It's worth noting, if I'm in dire need of this building to compete quickly, I can pay a premium fee for it to finish this turn, but be wise when you use this function. In addition to this, we have a reform available, and we can see that if we wanted to make our level 4 Silk Road Market, for example, that these buildings have a requirement before you can build them. As we look at the reforms, I need a school to be able to unlock that reform chain, which I don't have access until I do several upgrades on my main town and grow it into a small city. So, for the moment, I'll simply take the Foreign Envoys reform and gain myself a trade agreement to start selling some of our silk instead. My army is still somewhat recovering from a close shave during the siege of Wudu Town. Their replenishment is slow due to the severe lack of food in the western lands that Martin inhabits. Mountainous terrain neighboured by a vast desert. Not exactly farming country. To temporarily answer this problem, Jean Lu comes to me looking for money. He is rich in food but poor in wealth. This is an easy fix for the moment, so I make a deal. I've waited long enough. While the autumn season is still with us, I will move up the valley in a two-turn march to the occupied copper mine. I aim to encircle them at their most vulnerable, and exploit this during the colds of winter. As I complete the second part of my move, I choose to starve them for a season, so I can force their armies to take attrition and better my odds, while I'm well prepared for the cold. As I return in spring, I can now try and demand surrender of them, which if they accept, I would allow the enemy garrison to leave unharmed, in exchange for peacefully handing over the settlement. Despite this, however, I can't really take that chance, not with a rebel uprising, so I'll take the fight to them myself. Our decision to starve them out was well placed, and their lack of supplies as a town saw them in bad shape to begin with. The battle goes smoothly, as they are stretched too thin to secure all the entrances of this copper mine town map. I use my cavalry to my better advantage, and put this to bed pretty quickly. It took us slightly longer than I would have liked, but by this spring of 192, so with almost no food to our name and a small but growing income via silk and now copper, we have managed to secure complete ownership of the entire Wudu commandery. From the copper mine, to the main town, to the silk trader we started off with. Let's take an overview of the region and hit the commandery details panel to break down how things look now we've secured a foothold. As you can see, the Commandery's detail panel gives us an overview of all main factors within each of our Wudu provinces, from population to income to food. The one I want to mention specifically here is faction support, i.e. the support of the local populace for your faction, which impacts how prosperous your settlements and people are. As we can see in the recently taken Wudu copper mine, it states we still have nine seasons before we gain full faction support in the newly liberated province. If we view it in the buildings panel, we can see the red flag in the top right corner of the copper mine. This shows us that faction support will amount to a certain level of negative debuffs to things like income and replenishment that slowly reduce to nothing as the people adjust to their new ruler. This is something to consider when taking over a new province. You will need to account for additional military supplies to keep your troops going still. We move forward into summer and our new foothold of the commandery draws attention from an unexpected neighbouring party. Dong Zhuo comes forward and offers us a deal. In return for our vassalage under his banner, alongside the Han, he will give us the silk trader in Hanzhong. This presents me with the second piece of the puzzle in reaching my ultimate goal, conquering the entire silk road and building an economic powerhouse which I wasn't exactly going to be able to achieve without going to war to otherwise get it. If I do this, Jean Lu will not honour his deal to supply me with food if I accept Dong Zhuo's proposal of vassalage. As we have the whole Wudu commandery, we're going to try and optimise it for silk and commerce even further, by appointing an administrator. If we look at the court panel, administrators are the lowest available position in the court, and are ideally a great position for satisfying a character up to rank 4. In this instance, we've kept a pretty tight court here at Matung, with just myself, my wife, Melan Li, and our trusted champion, Pang Du. However, is this necessarily the best use of each of these characters? No. I'm going to open Matung's character panel, and in my accessories, I've come across a text called The Discourses of the States, which allows me an early additional administrator slot, as well as some authority and satisfaction buffs, which don't hurt either. I'm going to equip it, and as we can see now in the court, we have an administrator slot open to us. Now we're going to look to my wife and general, Mei Lan Li. 
She is a purple sentinel, and as we can see, her main strength is her expertise attribute. But let's refine her even further. She's gained a skill point leveling up in the last battle, and has a blue skill available in scholarship. This gives us a further 25% income boost to Silk in the administered commandery. Mei Lan Li can continue to be a general in my army, however, her retinue is kind of beaten up. So I'm actually going to call back General, which undeploys her and her retinue, and gives me the chance to rejig my army composition somewhat, moving it to something less offensively focused before expanding my empire further. Now I have a bone to pick with Jean Lu. He couldn't bear the thought of me taking food from Dong Zhuo, yet stopped giving me the food that I'd for well paid for with him in an agreement that he asked me for some terms earlier. If that's the case, then honestly, I want control of the full commandery to reap its benefits and optimize it properly. I have sent emissaries to Dong Zhuo. As a vassal, I can no longer go to war on my own. However, I can ask my master to join me in declaring war together. Zhan Lu is in Hanzhong town proper, which is dangerously close to the emperor in Chang'an. An accord is struck and I will crush him if he cannot be of use to me. So I move down the valley to engage Zhan Lu. He is surrounded by a full garrison and a supporting army encamped outside, most probably holding the military superiority right now. So, my plan is to settle my forces tantalizingly in range of his town and actually use Ma Tung's foraging forces in camp ability, which gives me not only military supplies, but also food production for my entire faction as well. I need to send him a message. I'm dug in and the war declaration has been made. I'm not going anywhere, so come and get me. He takes the bait. My one advantage during this battle is that I now have a rank 4 strategist. Not only does he bring some much needed ranged variety to my army, but he also unlocks all specialist formations for every single unit that has them. As an encampment gives us something defendable to work with in this battle, we're going to push our advantage and buy our archers the time they need to put every single arrow they have into the enemy. While I push out with our renowned Chiang Shock Cavalry and rush the flanks. The plan is executed quite flawlessly. Zhan Lu was foolish in his haste. I follow up and attack his second force's outer encampment and delegate the strategies for my generals to auto-resolve. In this victory, we take not one, but three of Zhan Lu's commanders captive. I could show them mercy, but I run the risk of them coming back. So I choose to swiftly execute all of them, wiping the slate clean as it were in this province. I'm actually gonna choose to loot and occupy here as well. The price of repairing and reshaping these buildings is actually quite acceptable, so I'll use this as a chance to demolish the damaged farm labourer camp building and bring it into line with my commerce and industry blue-purple economic build instead. With two commanderies to my name and more characters flocking to my banner, I have one final optimization I can make. My young administrator, Fugan, has come of age and is eager to prove his salt as a young noble of the court. I will give him that chance. So I go to the assignments button just above my commandery tab in the lower left. As a blue administrator, he of course aligns with my blue commerce and silk aim. And oh boy, he gives me yet another 100% bonus to my silk and spice income. These assignments are a mission of sorts that will see the character effectively disappear off into that province and handle the task that's been assigned to them. You can take one turn to call them back, but these effects stack with others in your commandery, such as your administrator's bonuses, and are a brilliant way to further focus your efforts in an area, whether it be thriving economically or quelling serious problems with the peasantry. As we come to a close, I've jumped forward just five turns, and already we can see the longer plan for my economy really starting to come to fruition. With both commanderies to my name, two administrators set up and two assignments set, with spare cash enough for my son, Macho, now ready even to take up the banner of Matung and lead a second force for us, we have nothing but options. I'm going to quickly use the pin system located on the left of the map to point out our options that are left on the board. You place a pin simply by left clicking anywhere on the map, choosing a picture for it, although they are already categorized, and then naming it with a little description. I want to finish the Silk Road, but taking the third trader would mean attacking my long-term friend Han Sui. On the other hand, I could break him, claim the Silk Road, and in it, the rest of Chinchung province for myself once and for all, completing a third commandery. I have the option to continue down the valley into Shangyong and claim a presence further south, starting with a lumberyard still occupied by the yellow turbans. 
Or better still, maybe I even look to cast off the shackles of my vassalage. Especially with the child emperor so dangerously unprotected at Chang'an, and Dong Zhuo stranded miles away in the desert, helpless to react. By simply focusing my economy and closing out complete commanderies, I have all the options in the world to work with at turn 25.